around. Great. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for our final lunchtime expedition lecture of 2021. Um, we are wrapping up after this month. We will break for January and then come back in February with our all new cast of speakers. Um, we are finalizing that list for 2022, which will have a special focus on sense in place um, that's coinciding with the 150th anniversary of the establishment of Yellowstone National Park. So please stay tuned for more details on that. And if you're not part of our uh, listserv, sign up and we'll send out uh, advertisement ahead of time about those speakers. So just a quick reminder, as always, please silence your electronic and mobile devices if you have them. Um, support for the Draper's Lunchtime Expedition programs has been made possible by the Sage Creek Ranch and Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation. These sponsors are the ones that help facilitate and make all the programming we do possible. So we are internally grateful for them um, and also, we are very grateful to all of you for attending, uh, your feedback, and your support. And we are recording these lunchtime lectures, and they will be posted on the YouTube channel. So if you've missed any of our previous uh, speakers, you can find their presentations there. Um, Draper curator Nathan Dorr is running the back end today. So for those of you joining us remotely, um, we encourage you to please submit your questions and feedback at any time using Zoom's chat and Q&A feature and we'll relay your questions to our speaker at the end of the presentation. Today, we are joined by Melissa Hill and Brandon Lewis. Melissa Hill is a live raptor program manager here at the center. She earned her bachelor's in wildlife and fisheries biology and management from the University of Wyoming. While, while there, she began volunteering for a small raptor education organization and her love of raptors took off. During her 20 plus year career, Melissa has worked with more than 70 raptors at four different facilities. Her passion is sharing her love of raptors with others in the hopes of inspiring the next generation of nature enthusiasts and of course, bird nerds. Brandon Lewis is our live raptor program assistant. He has degrees in history and zoology from the University of Wyoming and extensive background in public programming with the National Park Service. Brandon has helped the Draper Museum Raptor Experience expand their quality training experience for volunteers and has developed crossover programs with other museums at the center of the West. Brennan loves incorporating humor into his presentations as I'm sure you'll get a little bit of a taste of today and enjoys educating visitors about wildlife, their behavior, but their biology and their behaviors. And today they're taking a break from their regular Raptor program to join us and explore the past 10 years of the Draper Museum Raptor experience. So please welcome our December lunchtime expedition speakers, Melissa Hill and Brennan Lewis. Thank you, Corey. No pressure, Brandon. You have to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, a quick public service announcement. There will be no live birds in this presentation. But However, if you stick around at one o'clock, there will be live birds. That's right. In the same so, spot. In the same spot. So stick around and, uh, and our volunteers are going to be presenting a fantastic program after we're done. Um, so Corey specifically requested that uh, Brandon and I do a quick how we ended up in this career. Um, so I am working with birds completely by accident. Uh, I growing up never ever thought about birds and it wasn't until I was at the University of Wyoming and I needed some college credit that I ended up volunteering at Laramie Raptor Refuge and it was totally a fluke. But the first time I ever held a hawk I was completely hooked and I've been obsessed with raptors since. Um, and so that's what led me into doing what I do. And so in 2011, I was hired to start the raptor experience from scratch. And after a couple of years, the program had grown big enough that um, we were finally able to hire someone else to help me out. And that's where Brandon came in. You can't, you can't have, you can't have the only spotlight here. So um, I, got hired as the assistant for the program. I started uh, working with the National Park Service and really enjoyed doing public programming. And then uh, I wanted to be a zookeeper one day and I wanted to get some experience working with some different animals besides livestock and all the ranching background stuff that I grew up with. So I got lucky enough that I got an internship working with the birds here the first year that they were uh, doing presentations and then uh, was there for a couple summers, got hired part time, and now I'm full time as the assistant. So I got really lucky. <laughs> now he's going to go back to the now shadows where he the belongs. Shadows. Um, so this <laughs> this is going to be a little different than a normal lunchtime expedition. If you're usually here for those, those are usually 
presentations about some really amazing research that's going on. And instead, Brandon and I are going to um, try to give you a, a different view of what we do. How many of you have actually been to one of our programs? Oh, that many. Good deal. Yeah. See, it's so it's good we didn't bring out the birds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, you get to see the birds when we do a normal program. But today we wanted to share some of the highlights of the last 10 years and kind of show you a little bit more about what we actually do, um, a little bit more of behind the scenes stuff. Uh, but first, we have to get the, the legal boring stuff out of the way. The Draper Museum Raptor Experience is a educational program. We are permitted for education only through both the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Wyoming game and fish department and the main reason that I mentioned that if you've been to a zoo or a park and you've seen a bird show you probably have had lots of birds flying in and out they're you know really fancy and they're not the birds that you would see in your backyard and that's because permitting is for the migratory birds. Um, so non-native species, you don't have to do the paperwork. So for those big facilities, you're gonna have different kinds of owls and hawks that you don't normally see. Our program, however, is focused entirely on birds that we have right here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. That ties in, we are part of the Draper Museum, which focuses on the ecology of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, additionally, we don't usually have birds flying in our program, and that's because every one of our birds is disabled. They are all rescue animals. Um, so some of them can fly, but very few can do it safely. So that's not something that we really strive to present. And we do pick our birds for a reason, not just because they're native, so for example, our golden eagle, um, when it was time to get an eagle, we wanted a golden, not a bald eagle, because it's more important to this area. Golden eagles are icons of the American West, and the Draper, we actually do research on golden eagles. We also chose our short-eared owl, specifically because of her breed, her species. That's not a bird you get to see very often in education programs, and, whoops. Go back. Ah. I still have to talk. Apparently I hit a button. Um, and no, you don't get to talk. Um, and uh, they're, they're not a bird you get to see in the wild very often either. So that was a fun choice for us. And then sometimes we pick them just because of their story as an individual. And our Swainson's hawk Hayden is an example of that. And Hayden was suffering from lead poisoning. And lead poisoning is unfortunately a pretty controversial topic. And it is very important for birds like raptors that we get the message out about it so getting him was a nice way that we could approach that topic and be able to share why um, switching to non-lead ammunition is pretty important and basically the mission statement of our program with the Raptors is to have you guys hopefully by the end of a program care about the birds we're talking about and as a result kind of an extension of that caring about the wildlife in your backyard and all over really so what we do is is programs um, and that's what you typically get to see so we do programs on site here at the center of the west we do outreach at churches libraries schools assisted living centers and we now have branched out into virtual programs so we can actually reach audiences across the globe and this last summer fall can't remember which um, we actually got to do a program for students in bosnia and herzegovina which was really really cool Crazy things you never knew you wanted to know. So that's where we're going to get into the fun stuff, all the behind the scenes things, because everyone is familiar with us just holding birds and doing programs and stuff. Yeah. But this is all the other stuff. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So most of you have probably heard the phrase, you know, you eat like a bird, which means you don't eat much at all. That is so wrong. Lies. These guys Lies. eat a lot. <laughs> birds eat a lot. We have 12 birds in our program. And in just 2020, we purchased 5,100 mice, 1,300 rats of varying sizes, 1,000 quail and chickens, 67 rabbits, and a bunch of fish that we forgot to count. That's just one year's food to take care of these birds. So they don't eat like birds. They eat like raptors. We also do lots and lots of programs. Um, in the past decade, we've actually done 5,502 programs, and we have actually touched 370,000 people. Brandon, saying touch sounds kind of gross. Their hearts. You touch okay. their hearts. That's better. That's better. 
Um, and, and it's not me and Brandon. We, we could never do that much by ourselves. So in the summer when we are extremely busy, um, we really rely on interns. We've had 11 interns over the years. They have all been fantastic. Yes, there are only eight up there. Brandon was one of them. You're seeing enough of him. Still fantastic. Um, and then our first two interns were here before the birds and I never thought to get pictures of them, but, um, we could not do it without the help of our interns in the summer. And... We also have an amazing group of volunteers. In the past 10 years, we've had 30 volunteers on and off, uh, and we have logged over 14,000 hours in that time period. So uh, we also happen to have several of them in the audience there. So let's give a big round of applause for our amazing volunteers. Yay! They're amazing. And there's no way we could do this program yeah. and be where we're at without all of their assistance and help and support. And yeah. And in, in every one of these photos, you see a big smile and a bird and a happy person, but it takes hours to get to that even the first photo. And on the first day's training, when you start becoming a volunteer, um, the photo on the left kind of gives you an idea of what you get inundated with but you get to take home Mortimer T, Mortimer T. Owl Esquire our stunt owl that uh, basically gets you used to the weight it's actually the same weight as our great horned owl and get used to balancing something uh, you learn how to tie knots with a single hand you are gonna basically get used to all the equipment and all of the procedure and protocol things that we do the handbook safety and everything uniform and then all of the books and dvds are kind of a representation of all of the information that is just dumped on you uh, and you don't have to have it memorized immediately but eventually just through repetition and practice and even curiosity, you learn some other new stuff and you gradually add that in. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into uh, just even before the first day that you go out and hold a bird in front of a crowd. Yeah. And, and all of that work is for one thing. It's, it's for the birds. I mean, that's, that's why it. we're here. That's why you're here. Admit it. You're just polite and staying, <laughs> even though we're not bringing a bird out right now. Uh, so these are our 12 birds. Um, each one of our birds is required by our federal permits to participate in 12 programs every year. Our birds average 200 programs a year each. I'd like to think that they are the hardest working employees of the center of the West. Um, so, um, it's, that's a lot. And just like all of us, they don't always want to do it. I love my job. I am living my dream, but there's still days that I just don't want to go to work and the birds are the same way. And one of the nice things about having 12 birds means that if somebody doesn't want to participate, we don't have to make them. They can get days off too. They can have days off too. They just have to be snotty about it. So uh, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, what you guys see um, every single day with Melissa and myself and, and our amazing volunteers is only a part of what we do. Um, yeah, you see us go out and hold a bird and get set up, do the program, clean up, take everything away, and you know, then we disappear for the rest of the day. And so uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about what we do behind the scenes that allows us to be so successful for those few moments where you actually do see us. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so the picture you're looking at here, this is the hallway of our Muse building, M-E-W-S. It's the bird barn. It's a stable for birds. That's right. And when we started the program in 2011, by game and fish regulations, we were allowed to have a maximum of five birds. After the first couple of years, when the first year, actually, our peregrine falcon did 495 programs in the first year. Um, we petitioned Game and Fish and said, we need more birds, this is too much work. And they fortunately wholeheartedly agreed. So because of that, it was time to expand. And we started with the image on the left where we basically had a little grass lot wedged between the fence and the building out back behind the museum. And we have expanded to nowadays, we have three permanent structures housing 12 birds, a storage shed, and we also have an eagle exhibit in the Braun Garden with a shifting room that he can go into when he doesn't really want to be out on display. Yeah. And before you can even apply to get a bird at your facility, you have to have photographs of a completed area for that bird so we have to have everything set up before we can even ask to get the bird so based on the species and the little bit that you know about your bird's disability you set up their room and then you go from there 
And so the image on the left is of the interior part of the short-eared owl's enclosure. This is Amelia. She is a, a short-eared owl, wonderful owl species for our program. Melissa talked a little bit about it because they are not what you normally think of when we talk about owls. This is actually a grasslands bird. They don't like to be in trees at all. And so we had to kind of make the enclosure as comfortable as possible for these birds. So what we Basically, our job is to make their lives as comfortable and stress-free as possible. And one of the ways that we can do that is by having a nice environment that they live in there. And so because she is an amputee, she's missing uh, part of her left wing. Um, and uh, so she actually has different little ramps that allow her to get up into nice vantage points where she can kind of hang out and see what's going on. But she also doesn't like to be out in the open, out and exposed. And so you'll see we have a lot of foliage that we added in there. And she really does enjoy hiding under things. You can see a beady little eye looking out from the, uh, the br branches there. Uh, and it's always kind of exciting when we go in first thing in the morning and pull scraps, check up on the birds. And you go into Amelia's enclosure and you wonder, where is the owl today? Uh, because she hides so well. And so that's one of the things that we are sure to do is we rotate things out just so it's a little different, but she also is comfortable in her immediate surroundings surroundings. And just because you know the, you know, the lifestyle of a species and you know a little bit about their individual disability, it doesn't mean that you're going to get it right the first time you set up their room. So on the left is the picture of our red-tailed hawk, Isham. This is his mew when he first arrived. Isham's with us because he's missing his right eye after a collision with a vehicle. And so because he technically can fly, he is supposed to have a room that is 10 feet by 12 feet. Well, when we got him, we put him in that room. Room, and it wasn't long before we noticed he really just wasn't comfortable. He didn't move around much. Um, he didn't utilize that space. He basically just stayed in the same spot all the time. And the longer we've worked with Isham, the more we've understood that not only is he missing his right eye, he does not see very well out of his left eye. So on the right is where he lives now. It's actually a nine foot by nine foot room. It's smaller, but he has two windows and he utilizes every inch of this space. He actually learned exactly how big it is. He flies circles in that little room. Um, and the other thing that really made us happy and, and know that he was comfortable was he started vocalizing. So he talks to us and he did not do that when we first got him and he was uncomfortable. And so we're always paying attention to what the birds need for their emotional well-being, but we also have to pay attention to their physical well-being as well. And uh, a lot of the times, I mean, well, all the time, they're not physically or verbally, wow. Well, we start over. They don't, they don't tell us that they're not feeling well. And so the only way we can do that is to monitor their body language. And we're always carefully making sure that they're, you know, they're doing okay. Uh, if there's any abnormal behaviors, we make note of that and address the issue as needed. But uh, a lot of uh, what we do is we really do want to provide the best possible health care for our animals here. Uh, and we have a wonderful vet in town that we can go to in case there's an emergency or we're just doing some routine annual exam. Yeah, excuse me, annual exams. Uh, and so here you can see Teasdale, our great horned owl, and he is getting his heart rate monitored there. Uh, and uh, so it's always fun being able to make those special trips in and, and kind of, at least for me, see what's the vet do vet what the vet do behind the scenes uh, and uh, be able to help with some different animals that they're normally not going to be seen uh, but uh, that's only sometimes um, a lot of the time Melissa and myself are going to be dealing with some of the day-to-day -day care um, every couple months we actually have to get each of the birds up and we have to trim their beaks and talons um, animals in captivity especially because they get better nutrition they get better diets um, they're going to have their beak and talons grow i guess just to say raptors are going to have their beaks and talons grow at a faster rate than the ones in the wild because they're eating so well uh, and in the wild they would normally be exposed to a wide variety of surfaces that they would naturally uh, wear back those talons and beaks to a more natural shape through use they don't always get exposed to that in captivity and like i said they get better nutrients in their diet uh, and so we have to help them out by reshaping that beak you can see here in this image we're trimming isham's beak back with a dremel tool and we also kind of take little dog uh, toe trimmer uh, clippers and we'll just trim the tips of their talons uh, so they're not needles uh, and they're a little more blunted for safety and there there are always weird things too with disabilities that you wouldn't think of isham lost an eye but 
one thing that most people aren't aware of is how connected your eyes are to your sinuses. And you can see in the photo, his nostril is totally clogged. Um, this happens to him frequently. So usually when we have to catch him up to trim his beak, we also have to clear out that We pick area. his boogies. We, we pick his nose um, because we can hear him start to wheeze and he's starting to have trouble. So that's just another thing that you might not think of that comes along with dealing with these birds. And not everything is just day-to-day -day and routine that we can handle ourselves. Occasionally we have weird things pop up. This is an x-ray of our uh, peregrine falcon. And she came to us from a facility down in Arizona. And we were told that she had a fracture near her right wrist that didn't heal properly. That's why she can't fly. And about a year or two after she got here, she started picking at the feathers uh, near that wrist. And so birds pick their feathers for one of two reasons. They're either bored or they're in pain. So I took her into the vet to find out if maybe that old injury was causing some issues. And it got interesting from there. So I'm going to turn so I can highlight some stuff for you. So this is her bad wrist and there's no old fracture anywhere on this bird. So um, after looking at the x-rays, what we found out was that she didn't have a wrist fracture. She actually had patagial damage. And the patagium is just a ligament that runs from the shoulder to the wrist. This is her good wing. And you can see this is this nice thick rope. You can see the line defined nicely there. And this is her bad wing. It's just shredded. It gets really thin in spots. It's thick down here. Um, but that's actually the disability that prevents her from being able to fly. Now that alone might not cause the pain that we were seeing. But because we took the x-ray, we can see in her elbow joint and her wrist joint that she has arthritis. If you look at this elbow, you can see she has very nice smooth lines on the edges of those bones. Same in her wrist. They're nice and clear. And it's just garbled and rough in her elbow and in her wrist. So she wasn't picking at it because of the ligament, but she was picking because she's developed arthritis. So we always want to make sure that our birds are comfortable. So we decided to try some laser therapy. And cold laser therapy is just you shine a directed light onto a spot, trying to stimulate some nerve and some blood circulation, um, hoping that that might ease their discomfort. Unfortunately, it didn't really help Hayabusa much at all. We are really glad we tried it, though. It was pretty interesting. But so what we had to do was we ended up just putting her on an anti-inflammatory for that arthritis pain. She actually takes the same drug that my, actually my rooster just got prescribed it as well. Um, but she takes the same drug as my mom does for her bad knee. So we can help her stay comfortable in that instance. And a lot of the things that we notice that are just weird are because we're paying attention and we see strange things. And Brandon found one of those as well. So uh, this is Kateria, our golden eagle. And she is with us because of a compound fracture to her right humerus. She was hit by a semi truck and she uh, actually healed up the bone wonderfully. Um, you can see in the x-ray of her, it's nice and calcified over there. The bone is healed up perfectly. Unfortunately, the muscle tissue around that is not healed up well enough that she can actually hunt and survive on her own. And so she can't fly very well. So that's why she's with us. Uh, but a couple years after she came to live with us and join our team, we, I, I noticed that uh, she actually had been damaging her feathers on her bad wing. And so if you look at this image here, these are some, what are called barbered feathers. And that's where the bird actually picks at their feathers and kind of clips at it with their beak. And it really makes them pretty ratty looking there. And it was only on her bad wing, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, and so we try to reduce as much stress as possible. We tried to take care of our birds and, and get the ideal care for them there, but we really didn't know what to do, what was going on. And so uh, we have been fortunate enough that we can contact many different uh, research facilities across the country that have done rehabilitation and, and surgeries and care for birds of prey. And we contacted the University of Minnesota Raptor Center. And uh, one of the gals that works there, she literally wrote the handbook on caring for raptors in captivity. And so we were able to communicate with her, talk a little bit about what's going on, what would she suggest, and we got some ideas. And uh, later on that summer, I actually was able to contact our friend down at the Teton Raptor Center down in Jackson Hole. And you actually weren't here for this. Uh, you, you were off. It was a weekend, but uh, the the um, the staff that was uh, there happened to be passing through the region on on some work project or another, and they happened to stop by. I showed them showed them the bird, uh, and uh, <laughs> we were able to uh, talk a little bit about what 
we thought was going on. And they suggested that uh, it was nerve pain. And that's usually what's associated with barbering feathers is some sort of nerve damage or, or nerve pain. It bothers the birds that they pick at the feathers. It can also be a sign of stress that as those feathers are growing, they have uh, stress bars and that can eventually degrade the condition of the feathers like that. Or it might be feather mites and something's chewing on those feathers. But we are routinely spray our birds for feather mites and we've never really had an issue with that. So most likely it's related to nerve pain and they suggested that we use gabapentin, which is used to help some of those issues there. Uh, and so we actually were able to put her on uh, gabapentin medication. We sneak that in with her meals every single day. And what's one thing that's interesting is this is kind of a long-term thing. Um, it's always, you know, we're not... We don't know every single thing. We're learning as we go as well and trying to use the best resources that we can to solve these issues. And so um, one thing I didn't realize was that particularly with golden eagles, they don't molt every single feather every single year. Um, that's not across the board. And it can take anywhere from two to five years for them to gradually replace a full set of feathers. And so the feathers that we were seeing a couple years back with the barbering like this, uh, they might still be there today. I mean, there's a few of them that they're not nearly as bad as this one, uh, but we don't know if the gabapentin is going to really be having an effect until basically earlier next year. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're kind of still learning about that. And, and we're learning and our vets are learning too, because most of what we come up with are not things that they get to see and most vets don't even get to see raptors. So um, it's kind of interesting to be able to work with the veterinarians and have them branch out and try to learn stuff for us as well and not everything is just a unique case that's not you know a, an emergency but every once in a while we really do have an emergency and this is hayden he is our swainson's hawk and this is his halloween costume of a uh, martini glass but he's dropped his olives um actually no this was um this is hayden wearing an e-collar um this was actually a pretty <clears throat> scary event for us yeah hayden is with us he's the one who has a lead poisoning and whether it's from the little bit of brain damage that we think he has from his lead poisoning, or if it's because of some nerve damage he has from a pelvis fracture, whatever the reason, he chews at his feathers on his tail. And it wouldn't be a big deal. I mean, we don't want his tail to be ugly, but if that's how it is, it is. But when birds are growing new feathers, it's the only time they have a supply of blood to them. So tail feathers are pretty large. And when you chew on a tail feather that is growing, you can basically open up a vein. And I came into work one morning, went to check on everybody and noticed a little puddle of blood underneath Hayden's perch. And he was laying down on another perch and he does not lay down. Some of our birds do, but he does not. So I got him into the vet. We ran some blood work. He definitely was anemic and in trouble. Um, we, what we ended up doing, we got him back in healthy state where he was able to stand. That took a little while with some um, some iron rich foods, but we had to keep him from chewing at those feathers. So this was the vet solution um, to throw on the cone of shame. And it worked to get us through that one, <clears throat> excuse me, one disaster. But we didn't want to have to keep doing this. E-collars, they're called a cone of shame for a reason. Nobody wants them. Um, we can all laugh at the picture, but we can't take him out in public like this. And because... it wasn't easy to do. No, no, it was not. And he did this two days before I was supposed to go on vacation for a week and Brandon was already gone. So the volunteers that put up with him in this cone of shame and this problem are here and they deserve all the credit for getting this bird through this thing um, because they kept him from, from getting that cone off and from making it worse. But we didn't want to have to do this again. So again, we're going to try whatever we can. And here is Hayden um, in a session of acupressure. So our vet showed us the points that we can apply pressure to try to help, kind of like that laser therapy, to try to help stimulate those areas. And here is an image of me putting my hand where no human should ever put their hand on a bird. Uh, and it, it's not as bad as it looks, actually, because it's his hip. Uh, but uh, basically, with that nerve damage that Hayden received, I'm applying pressure to his hip for a few very intense moments. Uh, but you can see Hayden here, he is not really panicking he's holding really really still totally relaxed and we gradually worked with him up to this point so it wasn't a threat to him at, in any way um but uh he is actually the immediate results of those short uh acupressure sessions did seem to pay off i yeah. mean he visibly relaxed he there was 
very little tension anymore after that and his tail quivered a couple times but and he was looking a little sleepy yeah but unfortunately it, it didn't stop the chewing of his feathers so the next step was to try acupuncture um, so we do have a vet here in Cody that does acupuncture and so she took him on for some sessions and this was really amazing to watch so we'd have to grab him up and lay him down and we covered his head with a towel and and the vet put in all of these acupuncture needles and they usually stayed in for about 20 to 30 minutes and when all the needles were out we would take the towel off of his head and you're expecting you know normally a, a hawk would explode up off the table he was asleep uh so we kind of like had to like get a really nice massage you're yeah. just kind of groggy you don't feel like moving around Ugh, he was the exact same way we actually was had to help him jello out. um so we knew that it was having some pretty good effects and when brandon and i were putting the presentation together we were like yeah but it didn't work and then we went wait COVID hit and we didn't get to finish all of his treatments. Um, so we actually are going to try this again to see if we can get some more, um, some more positive results out of this, but that was the best thing we've had um, work outside of what our solution is right now. And in the meantime, our solution for taking care of Hayden is actually, if you look really close at the image, um, you'll see he's got a tail guard on and it's made out of uh, manila envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's taped onto his butt. Yeah. So he can't get at the feathers as they're growing out. And we're constantly checking up on him and making sure he's not picking at it or anything. So while we do spend a good bit of time watching and taking care of their health um, to make sure that the birds are all happy and healthy, we also really strive to make sure that all of the people involved in our program are happy and healthy and stimulated. And we're always trying to strive to do the best. So we want to stay on top of the best health care we can provide, the best information we can provide. Current and that training takes work. techniques. Yeah, that takes work. And uh, the, we've done a lot of really cool things. Um, the center has been very supportive of us learning and expanding our knowledge. Uh, a couple of years back, we took all of our volunteers up to Zoo Montana and we got to do a behind the scenes tour and got to work with some animals that we never got to work with before and, and learn a little bit more about. Um, so that was a blast. We also got to present at various conferences over the years. Um, Melissa and I actually went and presented at an International Avian Trainers and Educators Conference and we got an award for the best presentation that year. So that was really special for us. Um, and uh, we also have brought speakers specifically in to talk to our volunteers and, and us. Um, we have talked, let's see, what have we talked about in the past? Uh, husbandry, behavioral and yeah, training and, and techniques. The, the picture is actually um, Aaron Katzner, who is at the Peregrine Fund, which is the premier organization for raptors. She came and did a presentation about um, the state of raptors in the world. Uh, so that was really cool to have somebody that distinguished come just to talk to our volunteers and we also uh, try to uh, expand our current knowledge we've taken um, classes online through the Cornell Institute of Ornithology to better identify raptors as we're out and about uh, and Melissa and I have been able to go to different facilities and work with non-native species which is always exciting and, and fun for us as well so so those are just a few of the kind of weird things that you might not have thought of that are kind of day to day for us but in 10 years of doing this program obviously we have had some really incredible and very memorable things happen um, and so we thought it'd be fun to share some of those with you folks and one of the most memorable for me was when we got our bald eagle jade and even though we were so beyond ecstatic when we got our golden eagle because i'm sorry golden eagles are way cooler than bald eagles um but Everybody's like, well, why don't you have a bald eagle? Why don't you have a bald eagle? Why don't you have a bald eagle? Oh, fine. So we decided we were going to get a bald eagle. And when it came time to choose one, um, I got to fly out to Wisconsin to the Raptor Education Group um, out there where they had I, 10 or 15 bald eagles that were all non-releasable looking for homes. So um, in the upper left is our bald eagle, Jade, at the time three years old and in this huge flight barn about 30 feet away up high um, learned about the different birds that were in there and basically said okay yep I think that one's going to be the one that'll work great for our program so we got our eagle exhibit finished and because it has to be done before you can even apply for the bird we applied to get Jade here permits finally came through and Jade is the only one of our birds that did not arrive here via a car Jade actually flew on an airplane Brandon and I went up to Billings to pick up Jade 
and there was a reporter from one of the billing stations and we're all standing there waiting and and we know the plane has landed and we're talking to the lady behind the counter we're here to pick up a bald eagle who's coming in on this flight oh okay well i'll let you know when it arrives and we're standing there and we chit chatting with the reporter and we're waiting and after about an hour i watched this I, i'm assuming he was one of the luggage guys there's probably a much nicer term than that for him but he came up and the lady you could tell she was asking him a question he just looked at her like it's right there so jade had been sitting in that kennel next to the lady behind the counter for an hour while we waited for her to find the eagle um so we finally got our eagle <laughs> loaded loaded that up in the van brought jade home um and then this is a picture of jade the first day we had him her out in the exhibit um we thought we were getting a female bald eagle because from 30 feet away high up in there and once small people hold them in pictures they look really big and females are bigger but once we actually finally got a weight on jade after we had already done a naming contest for our female bald eagle we're fairly certain that jade is actually a male lucky for us jade does not care what his name is um, so that was actually a really memorable moment for me or several moments Another memorable moment for me with Jade was uh, I got to be able to man the eagle. Uh, and <laughs> what does that mean? Basically training the bird to be on the glove um, for the first time. And so that was really intimidating and really exciting for me. Uh, Melissa has been able to do that for all the other birds um, that have come here if, if they're not already trained. Um, but this was my first time of really doing that, uh, especially with an eagle. And so it was a very gradual process. Uh, it took a lot of time um, in order to work up to get that photograph in particular, um, because we we did this over two winters. And if you're not familiar with the winters in Wyoming, they're not exactly the warmest and most pleasant. Uh, and so Jade was shifted to a, a smaller enclosure behind the scenes, and we gradually got him used to me a human that normally would not be right next to you to get close to you, get you up on the glove, get some equipment put on, tie him to the glove. And then through months of training, really, uh, getting him closer and closer to a doorway, walking him close to the door, through the door, into the hall. And eventually we got outside and into the sunshine and, you know, nice and calm and, and still. Yeah. But one you, thing- You don't think about how scary a doorway is until you try to go through one with a bird that's never done it. With a seven foot wingspan. <laughs> um, or six foot for Jade, I guess. But uh, it's um, one thing we did find out was that Jade was okay being on the glove, but anytime the wind gusted up, which again, it's Wyoming. So anytime the wind gusted up, he would want to fly off and would be really antsy and really excited. And um, my arm can only take so much of that and uh, just holding on to him there. And so we decided it wouldn't send the right message to have Jade out doing programs like all the rest of our birds. Uh, and he just wasn't calm enough. He was a little more antsy than, than we would prefer to do that sort of a thing. And so instead, he gets to hang out in his exhibit all the time in the Braun Garden there. And so uh, you can see Jade nice and happy in his enclosure there. Uh, we've done some upgrades over the years. We're still planning some further ones to make it even nicer for him. But uh, one of the big improvements, it's kind of hard to see with me here, but uh, you'll see there's a shifting shed in the back there. And that is Jade's escape. If he really doesn't feel like putting up with people and all the weird things that tourists do in the summer or in the off season, he can go back there and get some time off and, and relax and take it easy. But it also allows us to do some training for husbandry techniques and behaviors. Uh, we have to get weight on Jade to see if he's overweight or underweight or if we need to adjust his meals. Uh, and so one of the training processes that we had to go through was basically shifting a bald eagle that is not attached to anything to go into the back shed on cue. And we managed to do that. Um, and uh, now he kind of does whatever he wants and and he's used to all that. So uh, it, it was just a really fun um, adventure for me, learning how to train a bird that size. Uh, and this is Isham, our red-tailed hawk. And I mentioned that when he first arrived, he, he didn't seem as comfortable. And then he has gotten more and more comfortable over the years. Um, so this is going to be a quick video. And this one just melts my heart. Um, as most of you are going to know, you're not supposed to have favorites. Just like you can't have favorites with your kids. We're not supposed to have favorites with birds. We do. This is my favorite bird in 24 years of working with them. I love this bird more than anybody should. So the, when I finally heard him vocalizing and we figured out that it was him, um, I decided I had to get a video of it. And so this is, I should make sure. Well, 
hopefully it, this sounds all the way up. Um, this is a very happy hawk. And he just got dinner. He has to wait till I'm not there. He's very happy about his dinner. And that still, to this day, that was probably 2013. That still melts my heart to and hear. Now he that. talks when we're pulling scraps and we're still in the room with him. <laughs> All the time. I love it. So that's always nice. Uh, another really amazing memory that I have every single year, actually. Um, Katiri, our golden eagle, has laid eggs for us every single year that she's been with us. And that is a great honor for us, um, for our team, our staff, and volunteers, uh, that the top predator on the northern hemisphere of the globe feels comfortable enough with her immediate surroundings and the setting here and the staff that she has laid eggs to essentially raise a family every single year. Now, they are infertile. Uh, they're basically a giant chicken egg, but, um, but it is a really nice thing to know that she really is comfortable with her surroundings. And if you want to see them, um, by law, we're required to destroy them unless we can use them in an educational sitting. And each egg requires its own individual permit and paperwork. It's insane. That's why people don't want to deal with permits. Um, eagles have even more paperwork. Um, but if you'd like to see some of Katiri's actual eggs, they actually are on exhibit. We have two of them in the Monarch of the Skies exhibit. They are inside a nest under some glass, but uh, Brandon had the lovely job of blowing those out. It was the most terrifying Easter egg project ever. Here, take these. Don't mess up. <laughs> My cheeks hurt thinking about it. <laughs> um, so uh, some other fun stories that we've had. Uh, we do a lot of uh, informal presentations in the summer months, and it, we call it our Relaxing with Raptors talk. And basically, it's a kind of a question and answer session. We have, uh, in the earlier days, we had the birds perched out on a, a block perch or a bow perch, and uh, they got to just hang out. And sometimes in the afternoons, we would feed them their dinner, and they would just relax and have a great time while people could ask questions, and, and we would do our talk there. Um, well, Suli, our turkey vulture, loves to eat, um, and we gave her a rat on this particular day, and we were out in the Braun Garden. And so Melissa and I were continuing on our, our presentation and answering questions and such. But a magpie really showed unique interest in Suli's meal. And Suli was a little nervous. Now, you have to know that Suli is what we call a human imprint. She has no idea that she is a turkey vulture. She thinks that she is a person. Uh, and so she doesn't really know what normal behavior is for a vulture. And so, uh, granted, I don't know what she would have done otherwise in this situation. But uh, this particular magpie kept watching and throughout the progress of this program, hopped down. And as Suli got a little more uh, startled and, and nervous, she kind of edged away from her food and away from this weird bird that just was checking her out and checking the meal out. And uh, it got to the point where finally the magpie just kind of went bink, 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 and hopped over and grabbed the rat and pulled it out of reach of Suli's leash there where she was perched. And <laughs> you can see she is just horrifically offended and, and uh, cannot comprehend, like, you did not just steal my dinner from me. Uh, and what was even more hilarious, because everyone was watching this this whole time, and uh, the magpie just ate her dinner in front of her. And I happened to have my camera with me that day. <laughs> it was it was hilarious. We're so busy laughing that we weren't going to go get it from him. He he earned it. The nice thing is she's fed every single day, so she's not going to be missing out if she loses part of her meal like that. Yeah. So. Do you want to do this one or do you want to do your, your drop? Yeah, you do this one. I'll yeah, do the dropped one. We're almost out. Okay. Be quick. Okay. Oh, oh, thanks. <laughs> we have go. great interns. And on their last day, depending on the intern, we like to mess with them. So they spend all summer giving usually scripted presentations. And on her last day, Nicole, who's right here with her stuffed turkey vulture, it was her second summer and we decided this girl could handle anything. So on her last show, when it was time for the red-tailed hawk to walk on stage, we sent out someone with the golden eagle. Nicole didn't miss a beat. She changed her script and talked about golden eagles. And then the next bird that was supposed to go on should have been an owl and a peregrine falcon popped out on stage. 
and she just went with it. And then like at, at the time we were flying um, Suliar turkey vulture. So I backed up to the edge of the stage and I gave her a nod like I'm ready to let the bird fly to you. And she put her glove out and called the turkey vulture and I threw a stuffed animal at her. She laughed so hard she was crying and she went on with the show. Um, and we did this because we knew she could handle it. And that girl right now, I'm so happy to say, she has continued to work in raptor education. She now works at Reptile Gardens over in Rapid City, South Dakota in my alma mater. Um, and they sought her out because she is fantastic. One really quick cool story is during that process of training the vulture to go across the stage, uh, we had some exciting summer adventures here. And so you can see Suli's flying across the stage to one of our volunteers who's got a little tidbit of food on the glove there. Uh, and we worked really hard to train this vulture to do a little routine where she would hop across the rocks, scuttle across the, gr the ground there. She would fly up to a rock and then fly to the glove. And then by that time, the little section on the turkey vulture was done and then they would exit off stage uh well <laughs> one of our volunteers actually um got rushed we'll by the call turkey her vulture nancy 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 got rushed by the uh by the turkey vulture because suli knows the routine she's like all right yeah give me my food come on well she rushed the volunteer and in the process of trying to get food out of a little pouch that we use for training so we have it ready to go for it they pulled the food out and it just shotgunned it everywhere and to the turkey vulture this was jackpot I, by rushing the volunteer i get all the food and so she learned this she's a smart cookie and uh fortunately there was enough food that they could get the turkey vulture back up nancy on the glove. nancy recovered nancy well. recovered and we finished the program everything was fine until the next day when i have to be the handler for the turkey vulture and uh, melissa was doing the script and we got to the same point there and i'm just kind of hanging out there taking a little more time, letting the vulture relax and just kind of walk around. And you could see there's an evil glint in that little eye there. Maybe not evil is not the right word, but there was a little glint there and she kind of looked at you like, hmm, I'm going to go for it. And I stood there watching. We both stood there and watched as the turkey vulture scuttled across the ground and went all out alligator and then stopped about a yard from me and I didn't react. And so she, you, it was hilarious to, to us because you could visibly see she was so crestfallen. Just, oh, she just deflated. It didn't work because there's no food flying everywhere. And I just kind of went, no, flicked a piece of food over there. And she just went yeah, and scuttled off and uh, continued the program there. So that it was just a really cute moment uh, with bird training stuff. Yeah. And <laughs> And we, trust us, we could go on for days highlighting all we of have lots mutton of chops on Brandon's first uh, day. Yeah. But There's that intern photo. We, <laughs> we want to make sure that we have time to answer your questions. 